what I want to share with you this morning is the question, is God enough? Is God enough? I have a number of points for you, but my points this morning are really going to be questions. And then I'm going to share a bunch of scriptures with you. I believe the greatest teacher is the Holy Spirit through the written Word of God. I encourage you to read it. If you have your Bibles with you, I, I ask you to follow along. The main scriptures will be behind me on the screen, but I do ask, pick, use your Bible, pick it up, look up the scriptures, check me, read the context, read scriptures around it. Don't take everything verbatim for what I say is after a gospel. Look things up yourself, study. It's really important that we're in the Word of God. It's alive. It's alive. So is God enough? That's a very challenging question. This is a very challenging message. It's not a downer message, though, but it's a challenge because there are certain things that God requires of us in ways in which He wants us to walk with Him in our responses to Him and how we answer these questions that I'm going to present to you today. Now, if you're like me and you've been a Christian for a while, if I ask you, is God enough? If you ask me if God is enough, I would say, particularly in church, well, of course He is. The problem is that my life and our lives don't always show up that way or demonstrate the truth. Because the truth is God is absolutely enough. He's absolutely enough. The problem is how we react and how we live according to that truth. And that's what I want to challenge us with this morning. So, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to take us to Numbers chapter 11. I'm going to read, uh, really I'm going to read through much of the text or all of the text first. Uh, and then kind of go back through my point. But let me set the stage with what we're about to read. The Israelites were on their journey after leaving bondage in Egypt. They were on their journey toward the land that God had promised to them. They recently, as we get to Numbers 11, had left Sinai. About a year earlier, after leaving Egypt, so they're about a year into their journey, a little bit more, one thing you'll notice if you read through the Old Testament, the account of the Israelites' journey, they complain a lot. Now, I know none of us complain. I certainly never complain. I'm going to keep moving in case the Lord decides to strike me for lying. <laughs> but they complain a lot. They complain, and then the Lord, because in that time they were not living in an era of grace, the Lord would send judgment. Then they would run to their leaders, Moses and others, and say, Please, please, please intercede for us. We're sorry. Change my circumstance. So you'll see this over and over again. So when they left Egypt, they complained. Then they complained, at least in one account, because of the lack of food. Now, in the account I'm going to read to you, they complain again for the hardship, and they complain about having a lack of variety of food. Still complaining. So let's pick up the scripture. We're going to try to read this slowly to you, but and I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but I'm going to pick up a few of these verses, starting at verse 1. I'm reading out of the NIV. Now the people complained about the hardships and the hearing of the Lord, and when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and, fire, and the fire died down. So that place was called Gadara, because fire from the Lord had burned among them. Verse 4. The rabble with them began to crave other food, and again, the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. There was a huge cost to them. I'm not going to spend time going there, but being in Egypt was not without cost. We forget. Also the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. Verse 6, But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. The manna was like coriander seed and looked like resin. The people went around gathering it, then ground it in a hand mill and crushed it in a mortar. They cooked it in a pot, made it into loaves, and it tasted something like something made with olive oil. When the dew settled on the camp at night, the manna also came down. I see, if you know the account, in the account even prior when they came out of Egypt, God has continued to provide for their needs. God has not necessarily given them everything that they want. That's important in our walk with the Lord. I do not, thankfully, I do not always get what I want. But the promise is that I always will get what I need. 
And the Lord was pro- providing to them every single thing that they needed. Now, yes, they had manna day by day, but they didn't go out and make the manna. It was provided to them. It was on the ground every single morning for them. Moses then becomes exasperated, and he needs help. And this happens to leaders at times, and they did to Moses, Lord, what am I supposed to do with all of these people? And the Lord provided to him and gave and anointed other elders to help. So let's drop down to verse 18. And he provides some specific directions. Numbers 11, starting at 18. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow when you will eat meat. The Lord heard you when you wailed. If only we had meat to eat, we were better off in Egypt. I don't think any of us are better off in bondage. Message for another day. Now the Lord will give you meat, and you will eat it. You will not eat it for one day, or two days, or five, ten, or twenty days, but for the whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. Because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him, saying, Why did we ever leave Egypt? Drop down to verse 31. Here's the Lord's answer in giving them what they asked for. Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail in from the sea. It scattered them up to two, two cubits deep. That's about three feet deep. Imagine quail three feet deep through the entire camp. All around the camp, as far as the day's walk in any direction, all that day and night and all the next day, the people went out and they gathered quail. No one gathered less than ten homers. Possibly that's 1.75 tons from what I was able to find. Then they spread them out around the camp, but while the meat was still between their teeth, and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people, and he struck them with a severe plague. Therefore, the place was named Kibroth Atav, which means graves of craving, because they were there they buried the people who had craved other food. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You deserve our praise and our thanks. Lord, I ask for your help in delivering this word this morning. I pray that you will allow it to do the work that you designed it to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first point that I want to ask the question, do we forget who he is? Do we forget who he is? The title is God Enough. The first question I have for us is do we forget who he is? So who is he? He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He created you and me. He knew us before we were even born, before we were knit together in our mother's womb. He was the creator of all things. To the Israelites, they took their eyes off of him and they began to complain. I contend that they forgot who he was because they were focused on what they wanted. They forgot who he was. They routinely forgot that he was who he said he was. Routinely. And that's a danger you and I have, to routinely forget that he's the creator of the ends of the earth. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's everywhere. He's the only one, as we sang this morning, that deserves my praise. He's the only one that deserves your praise. There's no one like him. No one like him. They forgot or they ignored, and sometimes we ignore, don't we? Sometimes we forget, but they also ignored what they, who they should have been serving. So who is he? I just went and picked out a, a few scriptures, both Old Testament and New Testament, to show only some of his characteristics to remind us. I don't have these up here, but you can write them down or just listen to them. In Exodus chapter 3, he says that he is I am. He's I am. He relies on nothing. He relies on no one. He's eternal. He always was and he always will be. When he said to tell them, I am sent you, what more is there to say? I am. I am. And all of his characteristics that we fail to fully understand and grasp because of our human limitations. I am. That's powerful. I am. Deuteronomy In Deuteronomy 7, he's described as faithful God. He's faithful God. In the New Testament, talking about Jesus in John 1, chapter 14, he's referred to as the Word that became flesh and he dwelt among us. So he's a personal God. 
He's very personal. In First John 1, 5, it says, He's the light, and in Him is no darkness. He's the light. There's absolutely no darkness in Him. In Ephesians 2, 4, and 6, it says, He's rich in mercy, and while we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive in Christ. I don't know about you, but I am so grateful that I live and we live in an era of grace and mercy. When you see the account that I just read to us, that was not in the era of grace before Jesus came. You know, God has not changed. I'm not saying He goes around and, and you know, sends plagues for people that complain, but what it tells us is that He does take complaining seriously because it shows our lack of faith in Him. But thankfully, we live in an era of grace. And He's patient with us, and He's merciful, and He's gracious because of the work of the cross in Jesus Christ. We should never forget that. Point number two. Do we forget what He has done for us? Is God enough? Do we forget who He is? Do we forget what He has done for us? It's interesting how quickly they forgot, and how many times they said, we longed to go back to Egypt. It was so much easier there. We had everything we needed. Everything was of no cost. That wasn't true. They were in slavery. They were in bondage. Their lives were hard. They were had masters that were making their lives harder and harder and harder. They got delivered, but they forgot what He had done for them. And they longed to go back. Sometimes when we walk this life, and Christianity is not always an easy walk, it demands something of us. Right? Being a disciple of Christ demands something of me. And sometimes we can long for the things of our own Egypt, the fun we used to have, the things we could do. Now we're all over these boring Christians. Christianity is not boring. There is nothing more than I would rather be than a son of God, a child of the King of Kings. I am happiest when I'm walking in the middle of God's will. I've had more than one time the Lord has asked me a very poignant question. Would you rather have this, walking with Him, or would you rather have that, the sin that I'm committing? And I will tell you 100%, said one more time, I am 100% happier when I'm walking directly in the middle, the middle of God's will and doing the things that I know to do, that I'm supposed to do. Always, do not accept the lie of the enemy that tries to take you back to your Egypt. Don't accept it. Capture that thought. Make it obedient to Christ. Send it to the foot of the cross and ask Jesus to deal with it. Always choose to follow the Lord and you will always be most joyful and happier. Doesn't mean things will be perfect, does it? But that's not the point. The provision of manna was a miracle. The provision of manna was a miracle. Again, they did nothing to provide it to themselves. He gave it to them day by day, but they got tired of God's miracle. They got tired of His provision. How quickly we forget who the Lord is and the ways in which He's provided for us. You all, like me, I'm sure have experienced things in your life that have not gone well. I've had loss in my life, right? Like you, many of you have lost family members. You've, you've lost jobs. I've lost jobs. And I will tell you, I wish my first response is, but I know my Lord. And I know and I have full confidence that He will take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. And I know what His promises are. But the problem is that's not always my first response. I'm grateful that in those times the Lord has brought me around to that. But in my flesh, my first thought often is that I'm sometimes anxious. I worry. I'm fearful. Until the Holy Spirit gets my attention and reminds me of what He has done for me in the past and how what His promises are. My prayer is that my first response is that I know whom I have believed in. And I'm persuaded that He's able to keep that which I've committed to Him until that day. And that means a lot. That means a lot. My third point. Is God enough? Do we forget who He is? Do we forget what He has done for us? Is God's provision enough? See, they had, the Israelites had what they needed to survive, didn't they? Nowhere in Scripture does it say the manna was not enough and didn't keep them healthy and alive. They had every single thing they needed and more, but they wanted more. They weren't content with it. 
it's interesting that their question, who will give us meat? That was a very strange question to ask if you think about it. Who will give us meat? Who weren't they asking that question of? They were asking the question in their complaint, whoever was listening, Moses, their leaders, whatever, instead of going to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to ask Him for provision. Why didn't they seek Him? Why don't we go to Him when we have need? Why isn't the first place we go is directly to God the Father? Why isn't that the first place that I go? For me, I know it's because of what I shared just a moment ago. There is this constant warring of the flesh, isn't there? And part of that warring in my flesh is being self-sufficient. Right? Part of that warring is being is being self-sufficient. And yes, we're to do things. And yes, we're to plan. And yes, we're to take action. And yes, we're not supposed to sit and have no faith because faith without works is what? It's dead. But it all needs to flow from the Father. See, there was nothing that prohibited them from hunting. There was no rule. They could have gone out and looked for meat if they wanted to. I don't know why they didn't, but there was no prohibition against that. The Israelites' complaining roused God to anger. His provision of quail was not a blessing. His provision of quail was not a blessing. Remember what he said, you will eat it not for one day, not for two days, not for five days, not for twenty, until it comes out of your nostrils. Sounds kind of gross, right? Or quail coming out of your nostrils. Anyway. Sounds kind of gross. It was not a blessing. Sometimes God gives us things that we ask for and complain about and continually push Him on, even though it's not what His best is. Sometimes. It was not a blessing. Sometimes we can be so stubborn that despite the Lord's warning, we press on and continue to ask for things anyway. That is called rebellion. I, I won't even say we this time, I rebel against God sometimes. I rebel. Anytime that I sin, anytime I choose something that I know He has said not to do, anytime I violate the Word of God, I am in rebellion. That's what they were doing. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, there's a good account about that. You, I don't know if you remember this, but despite the Lord's warning, they were asking for a king. He told them specifically all the bad things that would happen if they asked for a king. The problem is, they wanted to be like all the surrounding nations. They thought that was a great idea. Kind of similar to, I want to go back to Egypt. I knew that place. I want to go back to my bondage. I knew that place. It was more comfortable. Because I forgot what it was like back then. Despite that, despite their stubbornness, their rebelliousness, they were willing to suffer to get their own way in a God's against God's best. That is very short-sighted. I'm very short-sighted when I do that. Another example where he gave that to them something that they shouldn't really have wanted and asked for. My fourth point, is God himself enough? Are his provisions enough? Are what he's done for us, do we forget? Have we forgotten? Is God himself enough? Is the I am, is he enough? Are we following him or are we following his fringe benefits? I know we've heard this message before, but it challenged me once again in context of this message. Are we following him or his fringe benefits? Jesus is always where our highest loyalty and priority should be. Always. That may be why in Matthew 8, he tells the man who he called to follow him, he tells him to let the dead bury their dead. That sounds really harsh. But as I studied it and dug into it to understand more of what he was saying there, it could be that it was possible that this man wanted to go spend time with his father who, who was late in life and maybe was dying. It also could be that Jesus was saying, let the spiritually dead bury their dead. It could be that. Because if you look at Scripture on the surface, for him to say to this man, don't go back and honor your family, that's not what Jesus taught. That's not what Jesus taught. Jesus does teach us to be, to have him be our highest priority. However, he absolutely supports family and honoring family. And, he, and nothing, however, nothing should take the place of who Jesus is to us. Nothing. That's really, to me, the point of this, is that he's saying nothing should take priority over me. He's not saying don't honor your family. 
Will we follow Him just for who He is? See, if we only follow Him for what He does or what He provides, then we become frustrated and delusioned. Why? Because our focus are on the thing, on our money, on our possessions, on our power, on whatever you want to fill in the blank with. It's always when that happens and we're frustrated and delusional, it's delusion. It's always because we take our eyes off of Him. I read something that I said, heard something that said, the one who deserved the most respect, Jesus, got the least. We shouldn't expect more. That sounds harsh. But if our priority is Him, the one who deserved the most respect got the least. But here's the encouraging part. We're asked to follow Him to the cross. But we're also get to follow Him to the resurrection. So following Him is not about following Him to death. Yes, it's death of ourselves, but it's not about falling into death because when we die to ourselves, we rise to new life. That's the, that's the good news. We get to rise to good night, not just for eternal life someday in heaven, but eternal life that starts the moment that I say yes to Jesus. And eternal life, if you think about it in that way, every time I say yes to Christ, every time I say yes to obey Him and do the things that I should do and make Him first, it's part of living in the resurrection. That's good news. That's good news. Everything we owe Him, everything He is. He is everything, and we owe Him everything. Nothing is worth more. There's nothing that's worth more. So what do we do? My last point. What's the answer? I pulled some scriptures out of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Before I get there, I'm going to ask uh, Payson and where's Paul? If you come up and help me, you can help me grab these quickly. I just have an illustration that I have an illustration that I woke up one morning, four in the morning, and the only thing I was thinking about was this illustration. So I'm trusting it was the Lord. I did not have pizza the night before. So the first scripture out of the Sermon on the Mount is blessed that I told is blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength, putting others in God before ourselves. Showing humility. That's being meek. That's not weak. That's strength. You know, as men, especially, coming across as meek, the world takes that sometimes as weakness. That is not weakness. So here's the illustration. Paul, who's a really good friend of mine, he puts up a lot for me. There are very few people in life that I can pick on for being shorter than me. I'm so happy that Paul comes to this church because he's one. He's a man that he takes a lot for me, but I only, honestly only do it in jest. But what I felt like the Lord showed me in this illustration is that it's part, if I had the wrong attitude toward him in that and picking on him, it really would come across as criticism. So if you take that another step, sometimes when we're critical of people, we're saying, I'm so glad I'm not like that. I'm so happy I don't do what Paul does. I mean, look how much he's built. Look how short this guy is. Now, I know up here I probably look really tall, but all right, maybe not. Now, I'll get to Payson. I'll get to Payson in a minute. But think about that. When we criticize, if we're doing it, often we judge other people and we look down on them. And we that really what I'm saying when I do that, and I'm guilty of this, is I'm so glad I don't do what they do. And what does that do? That makes me look better. At least that's the attempt to make myself look better. And then there's people that are taller than I am. Now listen, I always wanted to be taller. I played sports in high school. I did pretty well at soccer. Baseball is my sport. I know you could care less about any of this, but stay with me. Basketball, however, I wanted to play basketball. It was the only team I got cut from in my entire life. It was horrible. It was tremendous. I still, I know that 
you and me say glory days to shaking our head all night, over and over and over again. The problem is when you're short and you really can't dribble well, it's really hard to make a varsity basketball team. Just saying. So I always wanted to be taller. I did. I always wanted to be taller. So Payson is an example of someone who's taller than me. But you know what the problem is? That can turn into envy and jealousy. Feeling like I'm missing something. God's not enough. He didn't give me what he wanted. He, what he gave me was not adequate. Right? Maybe I'm envious because he's got too much power. Maybe he's got more influence than I do. Maybe he's smarter than me. Maybe he's got more money than I have. Maybe because of his money, he's got more toys that I would like. Like a boat or, I don't know, something else. So really it becomes, it can become envy. Why don't you guys grab a seat? So this ladder I brought intentionally from home is old and it's rickety. So the problem is with what I just described is now if I decide to put myself up on a plane that is higher than somebody else's, now guess what? If I look out straight, I can't see them. I can see them a little bit. This is part of the problem with putting myself in a place that I don't belong. This is putting myself above, above other people. That's not who Jesus was. Worse yet, if I keep climbing, this thing becomes un- more and more unsteady. When I keep climbing, now I'm trying to put myself above God. And sometimes, if I'm honest, in my complaining, in my choices, and what I decide to do, I'm starting to get vertigo. I'm putting myself in a place that's above God. That's even more dangerous. But what did Jesus do? Jesus took on the form of a servant. When I sit here, now I'm basically on the same plane as they are. I'm putting myself in the same place that they are. I'm not putting myself above them any longer. Now I can see them for how God sees them. Now I can serve them the way that God wants me to serve them. Now I can make myself in a humble position and have humility. This is the place that Jesus took. He took on the form of a servant. He became human flesh so that he could understand and he could be the ultimate perfect sacrifice, the perfect substitute for me and for you. That's the position that Jesus took on. Thank you, guys. We're going to have communion in a little bit. I just have a couple more things, and then we'll worship, and then we'll go into communion. Just a couple more scriptures from the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> Chapter 5 in Matthew. Says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. Being poor in spirit is a recognition that we have absolutely nothing to offer him, but in him, but in him, we inherit the kingdom. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Show compassion to others. No one has been more merciful than Jesus was. No one. Jesus was completely merciful. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. When I'm pure in heart, it's not what you see out here. It's when the inside matches what the outside portrays. That's how I'm to be. It's to be pure in heart. Not having hypocrisy, but having humility. So serve God. Put Him first. Serve others. Sit in the middle seat. Fold up the ladder of pride, envy, self-righteousness. Put it away. Strive for holiness in our choices. Be men and women of the Word. Not just hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word. See, the real work is within ourselves, not the fight with the world. In 1 Peter 2.11, he said, Dear friends, I urge you as, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. And that's who we are. We're walking this world right now. I urge you as foreigners and exiles, abstain from sinful desires, the flesh, which wage war against your soul. And he goes on to talk about how we're to live in the world, being subject to other authorities in appropriate ways, etc., our biggest problem, my biggest problem, is us, is me. Our biggest battle is with our flesh, and always starts.